we good to go now? Yes. Okay. Thanks for coming, everybody. My name is Mike Waters. So I'm going to be giving you a uh, kind of a one-year update, and I'm going to be uh, partnering here with Steve Wall. He'll be up in a few minutes. But uh, this is kind of a one-year update. Last year, we gave you a preview of what Digital Globe was planning on doing, and this is kind of where we're at right now and the lessons we've learned. We're trying to trying hard to impart our knowledge and, and what we've done and and uh, learn any lessons and get any feedback from you all. It'd be, it'd be great. Um, this is a shot of Mount Fuji, actually, as uh, uh, we, we have a constellation of satellites that image the Earth. So if you've ever seen Google Maps, Bing Maps, Apple Maps, any of those, we supply almost all their imagery to them. So that's what our company does. And this is a fun picture. It's Mount Fuji as it come over the horizon as uh, our satellites were way off to the side. So really awesome pro profile view of uh, Mount Fuji. So I'll give you a little bit of quick background on what Digital Globe does. We'll fly right through this. It'll only take a second. We, uh, we have a constellation, that, like I said, of satellites that image the Earth. We collect about three and a half million square kilometers of imagery a day, which is about the size of India. Or if you like little things, 21,000 times the size of Liechtenstein. We downlink <laughs> about uh, five terabytes to six terabytes of brand new data a day, and that's highly, highly compressed. We turn that into about 50, uh, 40 to 100 terabytes of new products per day that we ship out to customers. Um, so we, we, on average, add uh, tens of petabytes of stuff every year to our archive. We have tons and tons of tape and over about 60 petabytes of spinning disk, disk at our shop, so a huge I.O. company. We also have a platform in the cloud where you can actually bring your algorithms to our imagery so we don't have to ship you these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of terabytes of stuff. You can come and torture our imagery in AWS. So we have a few satellites up. Two of them have been retired. We've got four other ones. We'll just kind of fly through this here. So what do we do? In 24 hours, we collect that. Seven days, one month, six months, a year. We can paint pretty much the entire Earth several times. So what, what happened? We needed a new architecture. We had a, a monolith, you know, insert monolith story here. Everything integrated through a database. Um, it took forever to get anything new into production, so that led us to do lots and lots of fun, unnatural things, probably like everybody else, where you'd glue a bicycle to a wagon to get it deployed to production just because it's easier to do that than actually get something new deployed. Very, very project focused at our shop, too. So if you wanted to get anything done, you had to tie it to a project, and then every project would twist the monolith to its own desires and, and collide with other projects, and it, it, was not, it was not good. But we had a new opportunity with our next satellite, Worldview 4. It's gonna be launching here in September of this year. Or things can change, but that's what it's scheduled for now. Um, we got the opportunity from upper management to give us the green light. Like, look, we even were tired of, of, of this old system. The cost to twist the, new, the old system to, to meet the needs of a new satellite were, you know, they weren't quite approaching the cost of the satellite, but it was getting ridiculous and, and non-credible. So we, we got to start over. What are we going to do? So uh, we as the enterprise architecture team, we knew that building a PaaS was going to be key we had to have something that just let developers do the best work of their life and not worry about, has IT provisioned my, my VM yet? Has, has IT done my F5 rule yet? You know, they, they should be writing lots and lots and lots of business values, what they should be doing. So we, we surveyed the landscape, uh, created some knockout criteria for a PaaS, what we needed it to do at our shop. If it doesn't do these, it can't work here. And we bash that against the, the list of passes that were available. Uh, Cloud Foundry was chosen as the leading candidate, so we did a few quick prototypes. We uh, verified what we called these knockout criteria and uh, you know, did things like pull out DEAs, do rolling upgrades, all that sort of stuff to make sure it never really went down. Ported a couple different apps. Our major uh, languages are Java, Ruby, Python. And uh, we, port, we created little sample apps and stuff like that and simple apps and ported a couple just to make sure it would work. Built some staffing and pricing models and, and went forward. So kind of our path that we found ourselves on is, I know it's a poor graphic, but we had the, the pioneers is what we did. We, we stood up one team and we called them the pioneer team and their job was to go get bit by rattlesnakes and step in the cactus and, and figure out how to do all this stuff. 
but it was really good. It was a great exercise. They learned a lot, and uh, we just started this kind of learn, fix, adapt cycle. It went really well. They, they learned a lot, and what they learned, we would feed back and, and, and fix, make better things that were painful. We'd go back and, and, and remove the pain. And then we expanded it to beyond the Pioneer team to another team and started developing a little bit more code, a little bit more code. And once you added a few more people, you'd uncover way more problems and, and, and well, I just asked Bob to do that. Well, let's automate Bob now, right? So we, uh, we kept learning and learning and learning and, and adapting and adapting. And, and now we're up to, I think, 14 scrum teams all developing code with almost all the code targeted. Foundry. We have a few things that, that, that don't run well in Cloud Foundry. We'll get into that in a few minutes. But almost all the apps are built and designed to run on Cloud Foundry. So some of the le lessons we're learning is vocabulary is important. So when you're talking with, with somebody about developing things, and it's, they're describing how they're doing it, and you're like, that? That will never run. What, what are you talking about? That can't run in Cloud Foundry. You're talking, you're talking about SAP, right? I'm, I'm not going to do CF push SAP and, and be done. Uh, and they're like, no, no, I'm, I'm running that on a VM. Oh, OK. Well, let's, we got wires crossed. So we come up with this vocabulary of these patterns of apps, right? It's pattern one. That's a 12-factor app. It's going to be running in Cloud Foundry. Pattern two, that means your VM. Pattern three is bare metal. With all the big pixel data we, we push around, we have huge HPC clusters that, that are, you know, compute on this imagery. So we have a, a lot of need for a lot of bare metal. But uh, just this little nomenclature has caught on and everybody knows. What are you talking about? Pattern one. Okay, great. And you got a whole context around that and you, you can just move on. It, it's kind of funny though that uh, we need some people to run, run our uh, operations and stuff now. So they've put out some, some recs for hire. And I seen in the rec, must be familiar with pattern one, two, and three apps. I'm like, that's, that's us. That's, that's not the industry. No one is going to know what that means. So, so some of the things we learned in these uh, learn, fix, adapt cycles, hopefully we'll, we'll, our goal here is to help you out and to, to, to maybe you won't get bit by the same rattlesnakes and step in the same cactus that we did. But microservices sprawl fast. You give the uh, developers the ability to CF push and push fast and push anything, it, it goes gonzo so fast. And so we had to, uh, we always had a plan. Yeah, we're going to do Eureka. Or we're going to do console. We're going to do something for, for service discovery. But it was a massive forcing function. To, we had to get that up and running quickly because of just how fast everything sprawled. Uh, co centralized configuration. People were pushing apps, and some people were configuring through CF ENV variables. Other people were bundling property files into jars, and oh, you know, cats and dogs. So we're like, no, we're going to go with Spring uh, Config Server. We updated the Spring Config Server to have a Postgres backend. It'd be nice if we could contribute that back to the open source community, but it gives a really nice way of, uh, of everybody attaching to that and grabbing their config. We also learned that API management is hard, and I get angry emails just a few minutes ago about API management still. We're, we're learning, but uh, we're using, we had a legacy product in-house from Software AG, uh, Centrosite, where you can track your services and who's consuming your services and stuff. So we have at least some dependency map of who's dependent on what and why. So that, that's been helpful. We're also using a tool called Apiary. I don't know if anybody's used Apiary, but it's a good uh, design tool on the web. Uh, we, we've bought into it pretty heavily. It makes it nice for testing your APIs and giving them a pretty easy way to do some markdown to, to define your API. Um, still learning. We don't have any golden magic sauce here yet, but we're learning. But that's what the tools we're using now, and they seem to be doing OK. We even have the uh, Software AG's uh, product integrated into our pipeline now. So when you first time you hit deploy on an app to, to get it running through our pipeline, it'll check with Centrosite to go, oh, I, I have no clue what this service is. You can't proceed past Go until you tell Centrosite what it's all about. So we're also learning um, decoupling code deploy from feature deploy. This is critical to, uh, if people are familiar with it, uh, I'll talk to the people who aren't so familiar with it. It's, it's the zen art, I guess, of 
being able to have your continuous delivery pipeline continuously delivering, but not actually be turning on new features in production, right? Have a very controlled way to turn on a feature. So the code just keeps flowing like it's supposed to, but you can go configure that new feature on in like a user acceptance test environment, and they can poke around and test it and, and like it. And then you just, there's no big, big bang uh, production day. It's code's already there. Just go turn the nuclear launch key to on, and, and, and your, your feature's live in production. So we're still learning there. We're trying to integrate that. We're, we, we're trying to use a feature flipper for Java, FF4J, and we're trying to enhance it to use our centralized configuration server so we have a centralized config of the apps and centralized configuration of all of our features. So that's the end goal of that. We hopefully get there. Some other things we've learned is standard, standard, standards are your friends. Uh, some people will kind of be the Wild West is okay, just let people do what they need to do. But we found a ton of value in having uh, every app. Your slash endpoint is a very standard endpoint in what it returns, who you are, what builds you are, you know, a little bit of information about you. The slash status and slash health check slash status will check your immediate dependencies. So like your database connection or if you have a dependency on a file system or, or whatever it is, it checks your dependencies like that. And a health check checks your remote dependency. So if you depend on a remote service, it'll actually go out and hit the slash status of that remote service. So it gives us a very standard way when things are deployed, I know I can go to slash, see what it is, go to slash status, see if it's kind of healthy, and go to slash health check to see if it's really healthy. So the monitoring teams are integrating all these calls. It's been pretty nice. Um, our build pipeline, we're actually rebuilding our build pipeline. We, we tried to do everything in Jenkins soup to nuts, and that didn't work out too well. And uh, we're trying to now choose the right tool for the right job. Jenkins does builds really good, but Excel release from Zebia Labs, that orchestrates releases pretty well. So we're, we're, we're doing that now. That's a big, big effort to redo our pipeline. And uh, one huge landmine, if I can keep you from stepping on something, at least this was big at, at where I work, is we have a bunch of things like that common, uh, the config server, that's common for everybody to use. We created this notion that there's all these common services out there. And well, wait a minute, I'm writing this. Is that, I thought that was supposed to be the one place where the company come to get this. So isn't that common? Well, yeah. Well, that makes everything common, right? You should only write things once. You should only write the, the function for the enterprise once, not 10 times. So technically every service is common, right? So we, we decided that it would have been a much better path to call these config service and things like that the utility services, right? If the utilities are down, everything's down. But it, it just caused so much confusion and chaos to call those common services. So what's the current state of at Digital Globe? Uh, we have open source Cloud Fund Foundry running for dev test. We have over 800 services running in there. They're not all unique. Developers are doing their own thing, and there might be 20 copies of the same thing out there because they're in the developer spaces supporting their development. And it's kind of interesting fact. I don't know if anybody else has any history on this, but we think that when we're done, we're going to have between like 60 and 80 microservices for this first kind of big release that's supporting the launch of the satellite. And so we're getting an order of magnitude difference between this is how many is going to be running in production versus this how many it is is running just to support all the developers. So it'd be interesting to hear if anybody else has any numbers like that. Uh, our DEAs are just two CPU, 16 gig of RAM, 3x over commit on memory. We, we, we found with running that many apps, we just can't scale with a, a 1x over commit, which uh, just, it was ridiculous. Uh, we're integrated with Logstack, or Elkstack for our logging. And uh, we're currently using log drains bound to every app, but we're we're looking at doing Firehose, and we just actually broke the ground on that on last Friday, which makes that a lot easier. And right next door, our friends are talking about that in, in another meeting. Uh, in production, we have PCF running in production on OpenStack. It's up and running. We have a few services that have been kind of snowflakishly deployed out there because we're rewriting our pipeline, and we didn't want to go back and rewrite the entire pipeline to deploy to production to replace the pipeline. So we just kind of hacked in a couple things at the end to deploy a few things to production. And uh, it's running pretty good so far. Some of the wins that we have is our development speed. 
we, once we had those patterns down, we could talk about them, the, the pattern one, two, three. And then for the pattern ones, we created a template app in, in GitHub where you just basically like uh, download the zip file, unzip it, create your, a, a new repo, and you're on your way. You change the name of the app and it takes care of, it's like fill in here for slash data, slash health check, all those. Great, e easy to onboard developers and t new team members that way. Um, ease of development, we've been lots and lots and lots of self-service portals. That's been a really, really, really key. If you're thinking about doing this, self-service is key. But one thing that we've learned is your self-service gets out of control. And in order to self-service yourself to a new service, you, you got to go to 30 different places. So uh, we're going to have to have like a self-service portal consolidation effort here sometime. Um, the visibility is great in the Cloud Foundry. What's running? Well, let me just do a CF curl command to the apps endpoint, and I'll tell you exactly what's running. The monitoring team does that. Once you can see everything, then you can audit everything, right? So as soon as we find new services, we can send off NIMSOFT alerts, who's doing what and why, why is there new things popping up in production or, or wherever. And when you get visibility and auditability, you get control of your environment. So this has been huge for us, is you, you know what's going on, you know what's deployed everywhere, and, and alarms can go off. And uh, the audit ability with uh, the NIMSOFT alerts being sent out, we're actually automating Elk to the point where it'll auto-create a new dashboard for that app as soon as it appears. Uh, the testing groups are just ecstatic, and that's mostly on because of microservices. We used to have a monolith where if you wanted to test, say, delivery of a product, you had to put an order in and wait through the whole thing to go to the, through the Pachinko machine to see if it actually got delivered. And now with microservices, you know, you can just test that just test delivery on its own. Uh, some of the other big wins is resiliency. Holy cow, we've had uh, compute nodes fail in OpenStack to burn up CPUs and stuff. None of the Cloud Foundry users even knew, right? Well, me being one of the admins, I, I look at it and go, why, why do I have new Bosch VMs? What's going on? Start peeling back the layers, find a big uh, compute nodes had vanished. None of the Cloud Foundry people even knew, and this, this happened uh, several times. So but we're very happy with the resiliency we've gotten. Um, some of the challenges we've had is uh, synchronization across foundations. We're doing two regions, if you will. We have two data centers that are geographically diverse. But uh, synchronizing across these is becoming problematic. How do you have one source of truth for UAA when you've got two different foundations? Um, best practices around load balancing with F5s across foundations are kind of few and far between that we can find freely available. So we're, we're trying to learn here. Uh, SSL, one thing we'd really like to do is have a domain per developer so you can be segregated off into your own domain. But uh, just to, due to the nature of work we do, even in development, we have to do HTTPS everywhere. And uh, as many of you may know, you can only have one cert and you have to have a zillion uh, SANS, subject alternative names in the cert. And that's just, it's kind of a non-starter to rebuild a massive cert every time you have a new developer start. But, so it'd be nice to just be able to point it at a list of, <laughs> here's a bunch of certs, go, go serve up all these. Uh, open source, uh, no support for HA out of the box. So these, uh, the development environments, we wanted to have some level of resiliency, but we've had to have, kind of hand roll our own uh, HA, you know, Bosch deployments and stuff like that. And the ECS team have helped us out there. It's great stuff. Um, Developer and DevOps access to spaces. That's been interesting because uh, when you're using these log binders, log stats, drain binders, uh, it just sometimes it kind of takes a while, we've noticed, to get logs out. And when you're first deploying an app and it dies in a test environment, it's, it was hard to get the, the logs out. So sometimes the developers needed access to these spaces. And we didn't want to give every, the, the fine grained access control just isn't there to just give them kind of a view. Space Auditor wasn't enough, but Space Developer is way too much power to create a snowflake and, and all that stuff. So th that's kind of the things that we're, we're dealing with. And there, there's some tension, too, between the microservice architecture and the licensing models from the vendors. There's a the tension there. The more times I do the right thing, if I need to break things down from one service to 10, it actually costs me a lot of money to do that, no matter which product I'm on. Uh, change is hard. Be ever vigilant. The old ways of doing things are going to come back. You're going to have a developer that's trying to cram their own uh, custom-built Perl into their app. Yes, real story. I need to package this entire Perl distro with my app. What? Why? <laughs> um, 
get somebody in executive management to back you. We've had many times where people just didn't want to do stuff, and we've had to play the, the CXX whatever said so. So I'm really sorry, but you have to get on the train. And uh, for me, I'm, I'm on the architecture team. Uh, we had to totally put it on the line and fight for this. The, 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 the organizations had really, really, really resisted change. But putting it out there and putting your, your badge on the table and, you know, this, this is the penalty if I'm wrong. Take that away from me. That's, uh, well, that's kind of what we had to do. But it's, it's been great. And uh, I think that's the last one. Oh, we get just one more. That our future needs. We actually have a, a need for a, uh, like an OEM style of, of Cloud Foundry deployment where I can put it at the customer site and just turn it on for our entire system. I don't think anybody's doing that right now. But if anybody else is thinking that, I'd like to talk to you. Um, managing multiple foundations as if it were one, that would be sure nice. If anybody's had any insight into that or know any open source tools that help with that, we'd love to hear from you. And persistent storage. Oh, wait, they just did that. Yay. Diego has it. Awesome. And with that, I'll, I'll bring up Steve, and he'll talk to you about uh, kind of the day in the life of a developer. All right. Thanks, Mike. <coughs> So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what our delivery pipeline is and how it looks uh, for a developer. So <clears throat> when they start off, they have their local dev, dev environment. They'll check in to GitHub, pretty standard stuff. And uh, before they would check into GitHub, they could use a dev environment. So we created a dev organization. So each one of these boxes here is an organization within Cloud Foundry. So they have their own personal space, their own sandbox they can use, and then they can check into GitHub, which will trigger a build. So the first, it's, it's kind of the, the standard build, right, initially, where you do your compile, you do your unit testing. Now, moving into the microservice world, one thing that we wanted to do is, after you did your standard build and created your archive, we wanted to make sure that archive was deployable into Cloud Foundry. So we have this functional test organization. And so after your, um, after your application passed the unit test, there was an archive. We create a space within the functional test environment for your microservice. So it's a clean space. We deploy that archive into a clean space. And in the functional test environment, the dependent microservices are mocked out. So we want to make sure that that microservice works on its own. It still is working within the what, infrastructural bounds, so it registers with Eureka, it uh, goes out to the config surface, it uses event service if, if it needs to, so it'll still work within the bounds of the infrastructure. It'll hook up to a database, but all the dependent services around it are mocked out. So if it passes the functional tests that it has, that environment is, is then torn down again. So we, we use the resources for the period of time we need to use the resources, then it gets torn down. And if it does fail the functional test, that environment, that space is still left intact so that the developers can come, or come back around and investigate the logs and do some analysis to see why it failed the functional test. So, once it passes the functional test, then we move it on into what we're calling the integration test um, organization. Now, the integration test organization is a full-up environment. So all the microservices within the ecosystem are in the integration test environment. And so then it runs some integration tests against your microservices and makes sure that it works in a full-up environment. The integration test environment is also a place where tests will go or development will go, and they'll just do some kind of exploratory tests with their microservices and you know, experiment on what type of tests do we want to have in our automated test harness. And then if it, when, when, uh, from the integration test environment, we have a bit more of a controlled environment called the regression test environment. Now currently, we have actually a manual gate, we actually have a manual gate right here. So somebody has to approve a microservice going from the integration test environment to the regression test environment. You know, we're, we're still dealing with some cultural issues where there, there, there's a, a group that they want to have control over how things flow into an environment. They want to make sure there's no change happening to this environment while they're running their tests. 
And we feel that we kind of have to earn the right in order to make that an automated deploy. So, you know, over time, we hope we gain the trust of the community to say, yes, it's all working, it all works well, we have this rich automated test harness, let us just flow into the regression test environment. But currently, this is a manual gate right here. Um, and then, so we got open source here in this environment. In our production environment, we have a Pivotal Cloud Foundry that we're working, and as Mike said, this, this path right here is one that we are just starting to burn in. So each one of these are organizations. So I'm, I'm gonna dive into what, each, what, what the spaces look like within each one of these organizations. So we have our organization here, and we have one space we're calling infrastructure. So this is where, where, where kind of the utility microservices uh, that Mike was talking about. So in that space, we'll have config service, event service. There's a few other services in there that are, that are more utility services. And then we have a space per business domain. So we'll have inventory and then each one of these, MCS and MPS, there's specific business domains within the, the, the satellite um, arena. Now notice, we have over here to the side, so this would be called our pattern one, and over here we have what we're, our pattern two. So th these are services that each one of these uh, um, microservices could leverage if they wanted. So they're all leveraging Eureka. We have this over here running as a VM. Um, we're using ActiveMQ for our uh, queuing mechanism. We got Elk over here, and then we're using Postgres for our database. So that kind of uh, gives you an uh, overview of what our environment looks like. Um, Digital Globe's hiring, ECS is also hiring. So uh, if you're interested in doing this professionally, there's some opportunities for you. And there's some contact information. And uh, any questions, um, if you could step up to the mic or speak loudly, um, we'll, we'll address those now. Thanks, oh, I think we got one here. Thanks, guys. A great talk uh, today. Uh, you mentioned earlier in the uh, session the importance of standards, and yet standards have certainly gone through a lot of evolution over the last five plus years in terms of standard boards and entities versus de facto standards through code. How do you guys navigate between the old and new world? We tried to. Uh we have a kind of like a hierarchy of standards generally. You know, we try to go with uh, open standards, industry standards, and then digital globe standards. So we, we really try if there is an actual industry open standard out there, we've tried to use that. Barring that, if there's some satellite industry standard or something in our industry that's fairly standard, we've been using that. And it, the last resort is let's build at least an internal standard. So when it comes to interoperability and things like that, you know, we're trying to use OAuth too. And, trying to latch on to big standards like that when need be. There's a lot of open GIS consortium standards that we leverage too. We're also, uh, not that it's too, uh, I don't know what the right word is, it's not too hard of a standard. We're using HAL uh, for all of our JSON responses, so hypermedia application language where you can actually kind of describe your structure in the response, so. Any other questions? Roll your, uh, not, why, why did you decide to use uh, Pivotal CF in production as opposed to just rolling it yourself? You had already done it for your dev test environment. Um, it, it's a comfort factor right, right now. The uh, upper management, you know, and the, the five satellites that are up there, or that will be up there, you know, they, they represent billions of dollars of investment. So when something goes wrong, they just didn't want to go open source at the beginning. They wanted to have a, uh, a big brother to be able to call if something was wrong. So the, we have other environments that, that Pivotal will probably be the vendor always at Digital Globe because of that reason. Any other questions? Well, thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it. I think it's lunchtime.